Uh, my name is Petra Sultan. I'm with Thrive Alliance, the Alliance of Nonprofits for San Mateo County, and uh, Doug Silverstein and I will be co-hosting today our uh, Thrive Action Group with uh, Supervisor David Canepa. So we're very excited to have him come and, and talk about what, how, how we can make, bring some silver linings out of this uh, really kind of scary and uncertain situation. Um, so uh, most of you know Thrive is the Alliance for Nonprofits um, for San Mateo County. And uh, first of all, I want to make sure that everyone's okay with the fact that we're recording this. Um, we're not really going to use it for anything. We might make it available on our website, but if you're not okay with that, you've been fairly warned. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some things that are important just in the larger nonprofit world right now. Um, first of all, uh, COVID is obviously a huge deal for a lot of nonprofits and Thrive uh, did a survey of 140 nonprofits to figure out how this is affecting them and what kind of a coherent voice for the nonprofits we can put together to present both to the county and to funders. Um, and we'll be sending out information about that. It was very clear that nonprofits are, are suffering. Um, I think environmental nonprofits have a slightly different angle on this, um, but it's really uh, great information for, for funders and for the county to know so we can really support the nonprofit sector through this really, really difficult time. Um, on the Thrive website, we have a page with COVID-19 resources. And on there, there's also a section on the very front part where if you're a nonprofit that needs help, you can ask for it there. And then we will try to do our best to make sure that you're connected with the right people who um, can provide that help. There's also resources for individuals as well. So um, take a look at that. And in addition um, to that, we're continuing with our other work. So I think it's really important that in a, we don't all get subsumed by what's happening. Um, we need to do as much as we can, but it's important to continue to do things like this where we're continuing to talk about what's going to happen next. Um, one of the other things that's super important that, and I know uh, Supervisor Canepa will agree with me on this, is to not forget about the census. It is still happening and it's still super important. And we are, right now, San Mateo County, as of a couple of days ago, is the, has the highest response rate of any county in California, which is pretty exciting. Um, but it's really important that we get everybody counted. We still have a long way to go before everyone is counted. And decisions about, among other things, planning, transportation, um, where to build schools and hospitals is based on census information. So anything you can do with your organizations to let people know that census is important Um, <laughs> uh, I think Doug was tired of me talking. Anyway, census is important is what I was trying to say. So um, if you need any information about how to, get, how to get the word out about that, please let me know. Okay. Next slide. So um, Thrive does a lot of things. So, for instance, working on census, we work on elections, we work on getting board members for nonprofits. Uh, this particular group, as you know, is about environment and sustainability. We're trying to lower our ecological footprint um, across disciplines, across sectors. Next. Um, and so we've been doing this since February 2018, so we're relatively new in the environmental space, but our real role is bringing together many different environmental groups. You guys are already out there doing the work. Our goal is to get you to talk to each other so it can be more powerful. Next. Um, in order to work on how we're going to do that, we've brought together a program committee and these are the members of our program committee and we're very grateful to them um, for helping give us direction, although we love to hear from all of you. Um, about what programs you're looking for. We, like everyone else, did a pivot with COVID-19. So for one thing, as you can see, we're not meeting in person anymore. Um, but we're also really focused on what this moment in time means uh, to the environmental movement. So that was not what we were planning on doing this year, but I think that's important to do now. I'm sorry. No. Mm -hmm. Um, and now I will hand it over to Doug. Yeah, thanks. So I'm going to mute everyone. If um, you want to talk, unmute yourself. 
the supervisor for sure. Can you guys all hear me still? Uh, okay. So um, if anyone, Petra, can you hear me? Put your thumb up. Yes. Okay. Great. So um, we're adding to what we do. We've um, we've had I think now 20 meetings where we brought the community together. Um, we are adding to our repertoire. Uh, one thing is a website that's coming very soon. You guys, a lot of you have asked about a directory and a calendar. We're going to um, put that together online for our community. We're also starting an action group around uh, single-use plastics, which I think a bunch of you have an interest in. We'll also start some uh, a, a weekly newsletter. But um, let's cut right to what uh, we came here for, which is to hear Dr. David Canepa and do a quick intro. David Canepa was elected to the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors in November 2016 and represents District 5 in the north part of the county, which includes Brisbane, Broadmoor, Colma, Daly City, and parts of San Bruno and South San Francisco. He previously served eight years on the Daly City City Council. Through public and private work, Supervisor Canepa has championed housing, equity, public safety, public transit, and important to our group, he's been a great champion of the environment. Among other organizations that he serves, he's the board of directors of the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, and he's been uh, serving on that for some time, Association of Bay Area Governments, and the City County Association of Government in San Mateo County, which um, I'm associated with as well. It tackles cross-jurisdiction issues of air quality, energy, transit, wastewater, and other quality of life issues. He was born in Seton Hospital, hence the picture, um, proud fourth generation Ohio County resident and graduate of Skyline College and University of San Francisco. Um, I've met with Supervisor Canepa a couple times and tell you he's very passionate about uh, and I personally feel that he exhibits some great leadership qualities and collaboration that I think will build strong partnerships with our community. So, Supervisor, thank you for joining our meeting. Great. Thank you um, so much, Doug, for having me. And I just want to thank um, Thrive, um, the Action Group. This is, you're right, we're dealing with a lot of issues around COVID-19, but that shouldn't preclude us um, from really embracing bold and audacious ideas when it comes to environmental issues and those of sustainability. You know, I thought today um, I have some prepared comments, but I think what I want to do is I want to really kind of talk about, and this sort of gets forgotten in the con conversation, I want to talk a little bit about, um, provide context about Earth Day, which many of you are familiar with, but then really sort of segue um, into the history of the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, and then close uh, with talking about um, what we're doing um, with the Bay Area Air Quality uh, Management District and what sort of data points um, we're seeing uh, relative to, um, uh, to the atmosphere. And so um, if you'll indulge me, I'm just going to uh, walk through um, some points I prepared and um, give me maybe five to seven minutes. Thank you. So. As many of you know, in 1970, the first Earth Day gave voice to an emerging public consciousness about the state of our planet. In the decades leading up to that first Earth Day, Americans were consuming vast amounts of leaded gas through massive and inefficient automobiles. Industry belched out smoke and sludge with little fear of the consequences from either the law, can't get away with it today, or bad press. In 1970, Earth Day inspired 20 million Americans. At the time, it's about 10% of the population. So by the end of 1970, the first Earth Day led to the creation, many of you know, of the US EPA, uh, the National Environment Education Act was passed, um, the OSHA Act and the Clean Air Act. Two years later, Congress passed the Clean Water Act and then a year after that, Congress passed the Endangered Species Act, and soon after, the Federal in, um, Insecticide, fung Fungicide, or rod Rodenticide Act. So a lot of stuff going. Here in the Bay Area, and this is critical because we forget about this, 
The fight against pollution began much earlier when in 1955, when the California legislature created the Bay Area Air Quality District mm -hmm. as the first regional air pollution control agency in the country. The leaders at the time understood that air pollution has no boundaries and that to effectively control it locally, we needed a, a regional approach. So in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, which may seem a long time, but it isn't, uh, the air quality in the Bay Area was nothing like it was today. In fact, it more resembled what you might see in modern day India or China, where smog from trash burning unregulated motor vehicles and industry frequently choked the region, causing residents to water, water to eyes to water, and in some cases to wear gas masks. So you know the situation. So in order to address this, the leaders of the Air District, elected officials from around the nine counties that surround the San Francisco Bay, directed staff to enact regulations on polluting industries that have provided an example for the state of California, the country, and the world relative to tackling air pollution. And let me just segue into this. One of the big issues um, I'm working on um, is seeing, it's an initiative, it's very bold, the governor um, came to the Bay Area Air Quality Management District and it's diesel free by 33. And so that is just um, critical. So much progress has been made around stationary sources, which are oil refineries, mobile sources, obviously, um, which is you know vehicles, cars, um, farm equipment. Where we need to improve is in air pollution is around certain communities around Bay Area highways. So in particular, an area um, that we're looking at is the Port of Oakland, obviously because of the, uh, the ship traffic coupled with um, the freeway there, um, 880. And so that has sort of been one of the, the areas that we're looking at and working with stakeholders there to make sure um, that we're able to um, improve the air quality there. So on certain days, we still exceed the standards uh, by the federal government for healthy air. And so that's why you'll see what's triggered spare the air days. We try to get people out of their vehicles um, into public transportation or in the wintertime, um, what we're doing around um, uh, smoke um, from fireplaces, right? And so really trying to get at the essence of um, what's um, formulating in terms of the, you know, what's being emitted into our, to our atmosphere. So um, the other thing is the air district has been able to determine, and this is really interesting, that air pollutants, harmful air pollutants are down 25 to 30 percent because of, of, of COVID-19. And so as policymakers, that should really give us um, pause. We should really look at that and, and, and to begin to, to understand it. And so to summarize, there are a lot of things that we're dealing with as local, local officials, right? COVID-19 is, is top of mind. You know, how do we deal with, um, you know, I sit on this, the chair of the Office of Emergency Services. How do we deal um, with that from that level, public safety level, right? How are we communicating uh, to our constituents? You know, shelter in place, right? So how are we doing all these things that are a necessity? But one of the things that I try to think about and sort of my scopes of interest is what do we do outside of that? Because it's important, we, we have to address this, this issue. But what I would encourage all of you to do, and I think you're doing that, is while you have this time, what are some of the forward thinking ideas um, that you could push forward. And so what have we done at the county, right? What have we done at the county? Well, um, P, you know, PCE, we're looking at, um, you know, solar and storage energy resilience and what that means to, to, to everyone. Um, we're looking at, you know, um, Dave Pines led an incredible initiative around sea level rise. We've created um, sea change, San Mateo County to address issues um, that are integral in developing plans to protect our infrastructure um, from sea level rise. Um, I've worked with many of you, and many of you I've met with in, in person around your issues around um, 
you know, using gas, not using gas, um, you know, going electric and, and seeing how that works. But I guess my, 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 my theme or my message to, to the group is, what's the next frontier? What are we going to, to think about and how um, are we gonna lessen our carbon footprint? And so we depend on leaders like you uh, who are you know, obviously uh, based in, in science um, to drive that conversation, to push radical ideas, to see um, if we can, as policymakers, uh, push, that as, push those ideas as well. Um, it's not easy. Uh, when I say it's not easy, it's not easy in a sense because it goes back to what I was saying earlier. We're really focused on, 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 on one thing. And you know, how do we get out of, of COVID-19? But sometimes you have to take the blinders off, right? And I think what you folks do collaboratively and collectively, as it was alluded to, is you're gonna be able to give us these ideas and say, well, look, you know, San Jose is doing this, or San Francisco might be doing this, you may want to consider this, or you know what, we've come up with this idea. Um, ourself. And so I think what we look upon, not only in your subject area, um, but in other areas I do, is we're looking at innovation, we're looking at creati creativity, and then obviously, um, you know, because we represent a lot of constituents, is, you know, the application of it and how practical it is too, right? And so um, I just want to, you know, say thank you for all the work you do. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, we do have, as many of you have been working, we have um, Danielle Lee, who's done a remarkable job um, at the Office of Sustainability, and Jim Megmeyer um, is, is retiring. And so if you have those ideas, put, put those forth. I know recently um, we've done stuff around, um, you know, plastic, right? And so moving these ideas forward are important. Um, one county I always look to for for guidance too, and just my staff um, outside of San Mateo County, Santa Cruz County has done a phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal job. Um, I always look at one of the things we were looking at was um, you know around shampoo bottles and you know things like that. So um, I always challenge my staff to, to 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 think about it. But I always I'm I'm type A. I always have to you know take a step back because I always want it today. So, um, you know, I just want to thank you. Um, at this time, if you have any questions for me, I'm, I'm here to answer them. Yes, we do. We, we took some questions in advance. Um, those of you on the line who have questions, please type them in. But I'm going to pass it over to Petra, who is going to read. Thank you, Supervisor. We definitely, um, we want, we have ideas. We have lots of ideas. Um, we want to partner with I always tell um, our community, instead of asking for things, come with solutions. So it's good to hear that you um, are look to us as leaders, and maybe we can partner together. So Petra, why don't you um, go for it? Great. So uh, thank you so much for your words. And I think you actually hit the nail on the head of what this group wants to do, which is to figure out what is the next frontier? What is the next thing we should be doing? So after, at, at the end of this session, we're actually going to go into breakout rooms and come up with a list of things that we all think are important that we should deal with now. And we'll send out a survey to the community and try to just prioritize what we think can be the next things that this group wants to put our, our efforts behind. Um, so we'll let you know how that goes. In the meantime, I would all love right. to, we, we got some questions in advance. I'm gonna start with those. And then if you have other questions, um, I, I, just because of the way Zoom works, I think it's easier if I read the questions, um, but go ahead and ask for questions, uh, um, ask questions in the chat. So um, uh, we'll start with one from, um, from Adrian Etherton, who's at the, from the city of Brisbane. She's the city's sustainability manager. How can, we ensure, how can we ensure investments made to combat our current health crisis are directed towards projects that will improve our climate change resiliency and equity for the people most impacted rather than proliferate the status quo, which is causing so much harm? Yeah, that's, um, that's a great question. You know, our health district, um, or excuse me, our health department 
I, mean, I don't know if many of you know, it's, it's, it's stressed right now, right? The structural deficit is about $64 million. And it, 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 this is something that we've dealt with before COVID-19. That should not preclude us um, from looking at health holistically. We know this, that um, you know, at people who suffer asthma, people um, who are subject to uh, very, various health ailments, we have to make sure uh, that the air they breathe um, is clean. It's clean. And I think what we really need to do, and there has to be a, a paradigm shift, is from COVID-19, you think about Highway 101, right? Highway 101 was, there was so much throughput, so much traffic. Well, we know this, that our workforce in San Mateo County, because they work at home, they're far more productive. They're doing many, uh, many great things. You don't need to work from, from the office uh, no more. You don't, you don't need to do that. And so what we need to do as policymakers, and it, this addresses health specifically, specifically is saying, and, and, and tell private business as well. Look, you don't need to have 500 people or 1,000 people going to one, one location. What you need to do is to see if those people can work from home. And what COVID-19, you know, through tragedy, good things happen, right, at times. And so this will be a proven model, proven model of how the county understands how the workforce works. Because traditionally, you have to be in your desk, you have to be in your office. Now what we're, we're saying is, no, we, we figured out it's working. And now the conversation is, how do we keep people at home? By doing that simple gesture, simple, so simple, so simple, takes uh, cars off the road and it lessens, um, you know, the environmental degradation that takes place when automobiles are belching um, smoke from their cars. Which is a great segue to our next question, which is from Emma Shales from the Silicon Valley uh, Bicycle Coalition. And I know that sometimes you bike down to City Hall. Um, oh, yeah. Cities... <laughs> So th this one hopefully is near and dear to your heart, but the cities in the Bay Area and across the world are closing streets to traffic and creating more space for walking and biking. Monday night, San Mateo City approved a safe streets initiative. Redwood City and Palo Alto are considering one. Do you see more walking and biking now in your district? And how can we transform specifically North County cities in addition to all of our cities to emphasize walking and biking and of course public transportation? You know, so during COVID-19, and Emma knows this, I always, I've always been a bi biker, right? So I was scared for my life, Emma. And, you know, maybe you could talk to South City, but um, yesterday I was on um, an El Camino by Kaiser, and there was nowhere to, there was no bike lane. I mean, it just, it just, it was a construction zone. I actually had to pull up to the, to the sidewalk. Very scary, very scary. But to answer your question, um, and I don't want to get in trouble. I promise you. I didn't. I haven't biked 50 miles this week. I stayed within the five miles of social distance. What was it? Mile? You can only bike five miles, I think. Um, yep. And, and and so um, I promise I didn't break that rule. Maybe once. But the point being is the point being is um, we need to do a much better job. I think one of the things I have an unincorporated area called Broadmoor. Um, maybe what we can do is to um, extend, um, and I don't know, I know Oakland's done it, I don't know how far it goes, I maybe partner with Daly City uh, to do a couple miles, um, but that would be great. I know uh, where I live, the Great Highway is close by, and um, I bike the Great Highway sometimes, they've closed the highway uh, during COVID-19, and so if we can identify areas, um, that would be fantastic and, and, and awesome, I think it would be, I think a lot of people would do it and it gives them an alternative because we've closed all our county parks. So you can't go to the beach, you can't go to the county parks. Um, so it's incumbent on us to figure out what we can do to maybe identify an area where people can bike and ride. I'm just thinking maybe Mission Street, I don't know, but um, Emma, we should talk offline after and figure out what we can do or what area makes sense. Excellent. Thank you. Sounds like we might be making some progress today. Um, yeah. We have a question from a high school student that's on this call. 
uh, Ava Payton from Mendler Atherton High School um, asks, which projects, products or behaviors do you feel Bay Area residents could forego or sacrifice during this time and beyond for the benefit of less climate change for younger generations like mine, hers? You know, I hate to say this because it'll get me in trouble, but you know, in the, in the grocery stores where I feel pain is that we're using plastic now, right? And we had worked for many, many years. I remember when I was in the, the Daily City Council, I remember this, and um, I won't blame San Mateo County for this, but I had told our city manager, I said, I want to do the paper, uh, what do you call it, the um, reuse, reusable bags, right, and charging, right? But now, because we're in this pandemic, there's been a shift, right? Now the shift is, not only do you have to buy your plastic bag, but you have to pay money. And so my constituents at two locations who will go unnamed, um, I get phone calls from them. They're saying, David, they make me bag the groceries outside. That's one thing. thing. Um, but now I have to pay for a, a plastic bag. And it's a little thing like that. We've always been taught through our behavior uh, to bring our bags. And I know we're in a pandemic and there's certain things that need to be done. Now we're telling people to buy it. Now, does that become the new norm now? Do people, you know, if they're doing it for one or two months or three months, is that a behavior that they'll continue with? Some won't. So if you ask me, that's a, you know, I don't know if I answered your question there, but that's a little bit of concern for me um, right now in terms of, um, the bags being, um, you know, people using uh, plastic bags at stores. Thanks. Uh, this question is from J Jane Batty from Miramar Farms on the coast side, and it's about yes. your work on a bag. Uh, the regional approach and response to the pandemic has clearly saved lives in the Bay Area. What can we do now to develop a more comprehensive regional approach to climate policy and mitigation? What regional entities are or might lead the way on policy and implementation? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a there, there there's a couple there's a couple areas, right? Um, maybe you're right. I've served on ABAG for about four or five years. Um, maybe that's the uh, the appropriate form. But you know, one of the things you have to realize um, in ABAG, I think um, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, uh, we're doing a lot around um, electric uh, vehicles, EV charging stations, um, getting cash for clunkers doing all that stuff. So I think one of the things I realize is, you know, getting collaboration and doing that sort of thing on a grand scale is, is important. And we have to do, we have to do that. But I think the, the quickest change, if that makes sense, and how to move the, the, the dial just a little bit faster and forward is probably through city council or your, or your board of supervisors. Right. And I think, um, that to me um, is is something we have to be keenly aware of. Now that being said, if we want you know if we want to implement something on a grand scale and have sort of counties who may you know may not be as progressive in other areas, that's a good place to have a conversation and to move um, those counties along. But if we're looking for and I hate to use this word, uh, Doug, immediacy and, 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 and action in, in sort of the quickest manner, I think that happens you know, at the city council or board of supervisors level. Sounds like you want us to come talk to you more often. Uh, yeah, why not? No. <laughs> Anytime. Um, this one's from Lauren Weston, the executive director of Actera, and it's more of a personal one. What has been the most impactful thing um, that you've done personally to keep the climate change on top of your mind during this moment or any actions that you personally have been able to take? You know, I think one of the things is you have to, and I'll tell you from a personal level, you know, you, you really, being at home, you spend a lot of time with a two-year-old son who you just heard, heard from. My wife, I think, you know, many of you know this, my wife has been for the last 11 years, the consul general of, El Salvador. So I always joke with her. I said, we got the consulate office here. We got the board of supervisors office here. Um, so it's, um, it's, um, it's been busy, 
Um, but at the same time, it's been um, gratifying. I really, I think the area that I'm really sort of really getting where I think the next, where we can move things, we can move things. Um, I think sea level rise is obviously, that's a big deal, the infrastructure of that. How do you, uh, you know, how are you gonna provide the funding for that? I think Dave Pine um, has that pretty much, you know, under control, he understands the issue. I think what I would like to do, what I would like to do is really try to see what we can do on um, things relative to, uh, you know, to, to the atmosphere, right? My, that's sort of my area. Like, what are we doing on making sure um, that we have uh, cleaner vehicles? What are we doing, as I mentioned earlier, and this is the biggest thing, what are we doing around creating um, an, a, an infrastructure that works for all? So rather than, you know, um, you know, certain economic groups, you know, having access, what are we doing to help um, other communities? And that comes with um, investment. Um, I think that's what the Air District is, is good at. Um, and I think that's really what I want to sort of uh, focus on when it comes to multifamily units. What can we do around um, chargers? What's, you know, what are we doing with the VW, uh, VW settlement um, around um, creating this infrastructure? How do we get off of, um, you know, gasoline? Is this COVID-19 a blessing um, in disguise? Because does it show people that life is okay, you don't need your car, that you can do other things by biking or walking to the store? And I think it's trying to see um, what from COVID-19 we can use as a springboard to maybe see how people's behavior has changed. I mean, I'll tell you this, where I live, um, you know, you can never, you can see San Bruno Mountain, and that's not because of the fog, but the views from my, you know, where my backyard is here, right? I could see out the Sutro Tower now, it's always clear. I could see um, Mount Davidson. And so do people sort of see what it is now and does that bring environmental awareness from not just people who are passionate about the issue, but people who now see what the new norm is. So for example, in other parts of the world, right? Um, I think it was, I don't know where it was, but they were able to see, a, uh, might be, it might have been India. They were able to see a mountain range outside the city that they hadn't seen in 50 to 60 years. And so through this COVID-19, is this the catalyst to bring people who probably weren't, weren't, weren't along for the, for the movement, but does that bring them to the table? And, um, you know, if I was in your shoes, um, I would be strategizing on how we, um, you know, how we build around that. You know, how do you build, build um, around uh, people's preferences uh, with, with cleaner air? I have a quick follow-up question. What are we doing with the VW settlement money? Where, where is that? Yeah, so um, as you know, there's CARB um, and there's the um, Bay, that's the California, sorry, that's the California Air Resources Board. And um, uh, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, they're trying to figure out now what they're gonna do um, with the settlement money. So we've done some infrastructure projects. We focused um, over supercharging, supercharging stations are, you know, someone correct me or fact check me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's about, was it $75,000, is that correct? Anyone? Okay, so uh, trying to figure out um, what we can do. The money, uh, some of the money has been dispensed, but more money, to, more money is to come. And so how we program that um, is, gonna be, um, is gonna be critical. Now remember, um, as you know, um, in the news, does anyone know what the price of oil is right now? Negative. Yeah, it's <laughs> negative. So um, how do you, as advocates, how do I, as elected official, how do we seize on that? I mean, in a good way, right? How do we sort of say and demonstrate, whether it's through policy implementation, that we don't need that. However, renewables um, or alternative sources of energy, do they, do, they, do they get more market share? You know what I mean? So, um, and there are, I'm sure there's companies thinking about it right now, 
but it may be it may be an opportunity. What it looks like, I don't know. Great. Um, we're getting some great comments on the chat, which I know you can't see at the same time. I'm going to ask a couple more questions, and then we'll go to some of the questions from the chat. Um, uh, Emily, who goes from UC Santa Cruz and Conservation Legacy asks, I worry the pandemic may cause long-term scares for public transit and large gatherings like marches, yet young environmentalists like me are more motivated than ever to take action. As a recent college grad, can my age group, how can my age group best work with you to address climate change during this time? You know, I think, again, it goes back to, um, I think that is an issue that, you know, Public, I think public transportation, as you know, um, some of our agencies with our, within our county, Sam Trans in particular, just announced this week um, that they're reducing, you know, they're reducing lines, right? And so public transportation is critical. Sam Trans is critical. You know, I used to take Sam Trans for a while. My, mom, my wife still takes it to work when she was working um, every day. Uh, we have outside our house, which is called, it's the 121, and that basically it circles around um, Daily City. There is that factor that people are scared and they don't want to, you know, they don't want to be in groups, right? I think what we need to do um, is to make sure to educate them um, once we get through this pandemic um, that transportation is safe. Again, it's like with, the, it's like with businesses I talked to, 90% of businesses are down in revenue, right? If the COVID-19 pandemic ends tomorrow, doesn't mean the revenue problem ends tomorrow. It means it's, you know, it could continue for, for several months. So I think what the transit agencies need to do is they need to build confidence. They need to build um, awareness. They need to make sure that um, their messaging, that it's, it's safe for people now uh, to come. But as you know, and I, I was the vice chair of the transportation authority years ago, um, you know, fare box recovery is, is, is never that great. And you can only imagine, and that was in great times, you can only imagine um, what it is now when you don't have riders um, on a system. And so I think making, to answer your question, making people feel safe in those agencies, making sure that they're emphasizing that, um, you know, this is a safe mode of, tra safe mode of transportation, I think, would be helpful once we get through this. Great, and I have a, uh, there's a representative from commute.org here who's uh, typing in some comments in the chat box, so take a look at those. Um, another question, will the county be issuing guidance or certification to businesses as we open up in the economy? And how could any guidance balance health and, health and safety with sustainability, or even accelerate our transition to commerce that protects both people and the planet? First of all, I want to urge all of you on the side of caution, okay, um, when it comes to opening up, okay. Um, there have been some, um, some comments to the fact that, you know, we should be opening up on, on May 6th and these sort of, um, these sort of dates and timelines. Um, what I would urge all of you is to be very cautious um, because that's a moving target. I think the governor addressed it um, two nights ago. Uh, when he said in his speech that, you know, he doesn't know when it's going to happen. Now, what I've heard, and I've been talking with the governor's office and, and people up in Sacramento, one of the areas that they're looking at is in this potential rollout. And it's going to be a phased rollout. Not everyone's going to get back to work. One of the things they're looking at is potentially construction. Um, and so, um, I believe that, you know, building trades um, and build, um, building trades has said basically that they've come through the state, they've come together with a protocol um, that protects workers, that protects, um, you know, people at the job site, whether it's um, hand washing stations, whether it's taking a temperature of each of those um, workers. Um, the governor, as you yesterday, you talked about the healthcare system, right, and allowing people um, to have um, elective surgery. So that was sort of an, uh, an initial rollout. But this is going to be um, in phases. And it's not going to be like everyone's going to be allowed to, uh, to work. As you know, yesterday, we had 110 people die uh, of COVID-19 through the state of California. That was the highest 
number. And so I think what I would say is we have to be extremely, extremely um, cautious. And the situation is so fluid um, that, you know, I get calls from people, small business owners, people who are working, you know, a job or multiple jobs. And, you know, they're using this, this May, May date as it, as it being the final final. And um, that, 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 that may be um, getting ahead of the issue. Okay, great. Um, uh, I, yes. It's Doug. I just want to jump in and ask one myself. Um, the county is one of the largest employers of, in, the, in the county itself, and you talked about people uh, working from home. Um, I mean, how would that look? Could that happen at the county? Might, you know, everyone whose last name is A through E works, you know, from home Monday, Tuesday, and something like that. I love that idea. And, um, you know, if everyone could just go in the office half as much as they are now, think about that, or a third. And, and are your meetings with, you know, dignitaries working well over Skype? I'm sorry, yeah, Skype, I mean, Zoom. Look. They're, they're working fantastic. I see you. I see more people in Zoom. <laughs> I see more people in Zoom than you can, you can possibly imagine, right? I mean, it's just, it's one Zoom meeting after the other. Now, if you ask me, forgive me for, you know, being ignorant, I, I had no idea what Zoom was before this. No idea. I use Zoom probably every hour, talking to different folks, talking to different groups. But this is got, this has to be embraced. The technology's there. Um, we know when people are productive, right? I mean, obviously, um, software can you know can manage, and you know it's if it's a call set, whatever it is, we know what our employees are doing, whether it's through reports, whether whatever it is. And so we were so tied to well, you know, you have to be in the office, and five people have to be in the office, and I'm talking board of supervisors and they have to pick up the phones, right? Now, here's what's funny. One of my um, staff members said to me, you know, David, right? And I, you know, maybe I had that traditional, you know, traditional thought. He said, why don't we just roll the phone over to our cell phone, right? Why don't we, there's other ways we can do it. Maybe instead of having four people there, you have one, per one person there who's picking up the phone call and that person could transfer it to someone else. And so, there's, um, you know, th we're rethinking how we're doing these things, but your idea, A through E, county's the, the largest employer in San Mateo County. Wouldn't that make a, a, a much more sense as opposed to saying, you know, Doug, you, got, you have to go to the office today because you have to go to the, you know, you have to go to the office, right? That's not, that, that thinking is, um, it, it's really not that good. It's not beneficial. So I think um, us moving forward, um, and I've talked to the county manager about this, and he's in agreement with me that we're going to look at basically how the workforce can work uh, from home. And remember, not everyone who works for the county lives in San Mateo County. They live in Hayward. They live in, excuse me, they live in Alameda County. They may have super commutes, right? Now, there are some jobs that may be necessary. Um, where you have to, you know, uh, do certain jobs, but there are other opportunities um, that we can really leverage. And you know what? I think the, the employees are good with it. We're good with it. So it's, um, you know, again, COVID-19, we, we, this pandemic has affected us all, right? right? No, you know, make no mistake about it. But at the same time, there have been um, different outcomes that have made us reassess how we operate as a county. Great. I, we have Thanks. a couple more questions. Um, uh, one more, Petra, and we'll go into um, breakout rooms. Okay. Uh, one more, two. I actually want to do um, two more from people who've, who've sent me questions while we were talking. And if they're actually on the line, that would be great. Both Diane Bailey and Roxana Franco, if you guys are on the line, um, uh, Diane, why don't you go first and ask your question and then Roxana. Hey, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> hey there. Yeah. Um, so I'm really concerned about the impact of the pandemic and the economic fallout on the budget in the county and, uh, of course, all of the cities. 
and what will happen to sustainability resources during an economic downturn. Um, undoubtedly, um, some folks will need to be laid off. And um, so my question is, how can we sustain a lot of the momentum that we've gained in actions and progress um, getting off of fossil fuels post pandemic? How can we refocus and help folks understand health benefits to getting back with climate action and, and keep to our goals on that? Yeah, this is the, the budget is the biggest issue, right? I mean, we don't know, well, we do know um, that this, the, the budget that we're gonna look at is gonna really have to make us reassess how we're gonna have to do business, right? I mean, there, there's no way. So I think one of the things that we've, I've asked the county manager is, is help us understand what, pl what the plan is, right? Um, what are we gonna do? Is it, because people always think it's massive layoffs, right? And in 2008, when I was on the city council in Daly City, we all, we, all of you dealt with the Great Recession, right? So there's different ways to, to go about it. So, you know, is it furloughing? Is it wh whatever, whatever it is and whatever iteration it is, um, we have to, to look at that. Because remember, when you cut jobs right away and you... Um, uh, you know, you let people go, you basically change the culture of your organization. And trying to rebuild that, trying to rebuild that may take five to eight years. Does that make sense? And so what we have to do is we have to be thoughtful. We have to understand what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, I promise that is not my backyard. Hold on. Oh. <laughs> Hold on. So, um, yeah, we have to we have to look at what makes sense. You know what I mean? So we have to look at. Um, and by the way, that is my backyard. Are you there? <laughs> that is. Yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's what's you know that's. And to answer your question, sustain, sustainability, you're right. That's one of the issues. I mean, that's one of the departments, right, that people – so what do they look at at local government? What are the first things they look at when you're, you're cutting, right, in terms of, like, a city? Usually it's your library, libraries, usually your parks. Those are kind of the two things that are, you know, you know local governments look at because in local government – Police and fire amongst, um, you know, the state of California and the 400 and odd cities that are there, that polls the highest in terms of what people want. So we really have to make a, an effort to understand um, what the plan is and um, understand that if we do pair the workforce, um, the culture um, could be dramatically impacted. And that, um, you know, that could be, that, that, that's an issue. Supervisor Canepa, we're going to have one last question for you, and then we're going to get into our breakout room so that we can right. have some results of some, some, so that you can hear back from us um, what it is that we want. So um, Roxana Franco from Nuestra Casa has a question. Roxana. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. So I work for Nuestra Casa. We're a nonprofit here in East Palo Alto. And one of the things that we're seeing, obviously, is mental health issues. So yeah. my concern is, what are we doing to support, I don't say underrepresented, I say resilient. So that's when I say resilient, that's what I mean. Um, it's more of what are we doing to support our resilient communities who are continuously putting their lives at risk in order to provide for their families. And it's not just financial, it's also mental health support. So something that we're seeing on the ground is people are really stressing out in ways that we knew was going to happen. It's kind of like if do I, if I go to work today and I put myself at risk, will I rather go work and put myself at risk than not have money to help support? And I think one thing, I came in a little late, but one thing I was listening to, like maybe working certain days, like A through F or whatever. Unfortunately, at communities like East Palo Alto, I don't think we can afford to work once or twice a week when we have high rent costs and we're barely making minimum. So my thing is like, take those kind of communities into account because it's a lot to even just ask 
people to work once a week, you know? I know it benefits people that work office jobs or tech companies or certain jobs, but when you're working as a gardener, when you're working in construction, when you're a farm worker, like it's really hard to get by with just one day a week of a job. So yeah, just my little so, yeah no, that's great. You know, what, let me tell you what I see in my community, right? So um, Daly City um, is similar to East Palo Alto, right? So we see a lot of food lines. It's a big, um, it's a big, big deal. So I've been working with Second Harvest just for years. And I know the lady. Um, I know the folks who work there. Um, Reina Meafua. I know all these people. They're friends. So when you have cars stacked up on, if you know where Mission Street in Daly City is, you have cars stacked up um, and people getting food. And like you said, my constituents work in two, um, three jobs. Um, single mothers, right? Single fathers, just trying to get by. It's a real social problem. It's real bad. And um, one of the things we're working on, let me tell you, is around, um, and I'm proud of this and because we've worked with them for years. We have up here in um, San Mateo County, it's called the Filipino Mental Health Initiative, um, the Asian American um, uh, Mental Health Initiative, and we have the Chinese Health Initiative. And so um, what I've done with them for years um, it's real cool. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of like what's Poetry Slam. Um, we do a Poetry Slam every year. We talk about, um, they talk about speakers, the youth, whoever, um, adults. Um, they talk about uh, mental, health, mental health, whether it's through, um, through poetry, whether it's through, um, you know, spoken word, whatever you want to talk about it. We need as a, a society, we need to make sure that we check in with people you know, is everything cool? Um, we need to make sure that people have access um, to mental, mental health um, professionals. We need to make sure that people are speaking um, in their language, whether it's Spanish, um, whether it's Chinese, uh, whether it's, you know, whether it's uh, Tagalog, whether um, in my community, we have a huge um, Arabic community. Um, and so we need to make sure that we're, we're, we're culturally um, competent and that the community, as you know, have trusted uh, partners. If we do not, um, then we're missing out on a, on a whole segment. I think in, in, in our district, my district, uh, District 5, you know, I think we've done um, incredible work and those advocates have really just done a great job because they've been there, they've been doing this uh, for years. I believe, and I, I mentioned this twice, our biggest county issue right now, man, I see it. I see it every day, is, is the food insecurity. And so the last Board of Supervisors meeting, because I started, I've been doing this for, you know, I've worked for elected officials. I've been doing this for 15, 20 years. Um, the biggest thing that I've heard right now is people calling me for food. Now, you know, people would call me before but now it's like our office is, um, is that's our big, our big issue. Hey, Mr. Canop, or hey, you know, I need, I, I need groceries. And so I've talked to the county manager. We've created a food czar, which is excellent, awesome. And so that food czar, they're going to double down in terms of, um, you know, providing um, more distribution centers um, to, to deal with that. So, um, you know, I feel you, um, EP at East Palo Alto, um, you know, is similar to Daly City in, in, in many ways. And we cannot, uh, we cannot leave people behind, that's for sure. That's true, are you still there? I'll, um, thank you so much, Supervisor Canapa. And I, um, I've seen you at work in Starbucks in Daly City or Colma. <laughs> meeting after meeting um, with all your constituents and you've got a lot um, on your plate for sure. Um, thank you for taking time to talk with us. If you want to hang out, we're going to go into a few breakout rooms and talk about what we think we can come back to you with. Um, if not, we know you're pressed for time, but um, we hope to stay in touch with you and partner with you and figure out how we can work together um, to benefit all of our communities in all the ways that we're struggling right now. Awesome, and, and Doug, it, please give me the most radical idea, okay?
Well, I think, you know, getting people off the roads is, is not radical, actually. It's yeah. probably pretty yeah. simple. Yeah. And that doesn't need policy. It just really needs leadership, I think. Yeah. Uh, right? Or it doesn't need policy. You're right. So, um, other good ideas. I'm sure uh, everyone's on, uh, you know, thinking, well, why did he, you know, why is he talking about that one? But there's, we'll come, back, definitely come back to you, and we we'll want to stay in touch. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being. Thank you very much, Doug. All right, Petra may have dropped off, but what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to go into four groups. I said I was going to go to five, and bear with me on this because um, I'm back. I've, not, I've done this. For, but and I, I asked certain people to take notes, um, and I don't I, I don't want to bother trying to figure out who's going to go into what room. So if I ask you to take notes and you're in a room with someone else who asks to take notes, um, we'll just figure it out. But if one person in each room could pull up a Word doc and take some notes, um, maybe share your screen. What I want to um, to have everyone do is just uh, kind of a brainstorming session on what policies or programs you think we should be cooperating on as a community or with other communities right now to, um, to take advantage of the situation. And, you know, someone said, we, uh, I think you forget, we feel guilty a little bit saying that we can take advantage of the situation right now, but, um, and it is tough. A lot of it's, you know, listening to what the supervisor had to say about Daily City is definitely sobering. It makes me, uh, feel stupid asking about telecommuting sometimes. But what that said, um, as we break out, what could what could we focus on as a community? So I'm gonna go do that now and um, let's see if I can So and while he's doing uh, that we're not we're we won't come back afterwards. So the idea is to come up with ideas and then we're going to send a follow up email to all of you with some notes from this meeting because I think there's a lot of interesting things that happened today. Um, as well as a survey. So we'll, we will take the ideas um, that we come up with as a group and try to distill them into a reasonable list and then have everybody vote on them and just kind of, so we get an idea from you guys, from the community, where we should be focusing our efforts and then we can hopefully work through it together. So we won't be reconvening, but thank you guys all so much for coming and for participating. Um, and we'll okay, so I'm, moving, I'm going to tell you guys what I'm doing here. I'm moving all participants into breakout rooms automatically. I'm allowing participants to return to the main. I'm not doing that. Um, breakout rooms close automatically after 30 minutes, let's say. And um, there'll be a countdown. So here we go. Let's see if this works. Are you guys moving automatically into rooms? No. Okay, let me try that again. Breakout rooms will close. Uh, Are you the host? If you're the, only the host. Yeah. Who's host? No, let me try it again. Um, breakout room. Do I have to create rooms, recreate? Recover, pre-assign, recreate all rooms. Okay, here we go. Assign um, into four rooms. Just make automatically. Sure. Here we go. All right, I'm only with four participants, is that right? Oh, here people are joining. Jamie. Libby, can you hear me? Libby, can you hear me? 